Our Father and our God, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for who you are, for all you've done in our lives, for the opportunity you've given us to study your word together, to feast upon it. I just ask that you would filter out all of that, which is not true, but just seal to our hearts only the truth, because we desire to grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We finally made it to August. We're looking forward to September. September 8th is Feast of Trumpets. I believe that's a possibility. For those of you who are just watching for the uh, Lord to return these videos, we've been focused on our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Epistle to the Philippians. In the meantime, uh, there are many of us out here who do not want to the Lord to appear and us be living under the carnal, fleshly mandates of the law as a rule of life. We just read the words, the loss of all things by Paul, that he counted all things loss. He counted all things rubbish. And only to now see death to self, our being made conformable, that is a passive voice, that's there's there's an outside operator we didn't make we're not making ourselves conformable but we've we're being made conformable to his death and his resurrection and i believe that we're looking at resurrection life now now many christians read this the passage that we're looking at we're in the third chapter uh somewhere around verse 10 uh, uh 9 10 11 12 somewhere in that area and many christians read these verses and they think that this is talking about uh, something that we either do to come to know the lord or after we've come to know to know the lord then as far as our walk our relationship with him goes uh, these are things that we have to do uh, in order to become a better christian if i could put that in quotes and i don't believe that's what this passage is talking about at all I believe it's talking about an out resurrection from the dead. I pointed out that's a unique word used only here. You'll never find that word anywhere else. It is a resurrection life now. Now, I want you to consider very seriously, folks, just how, how not unusual it would be for our life in him, our walk in him, to be, just, to be put couched in those terms of resurrection life. That's the beauty of it, and that's, that's what many Christians fail to see. Resurrection life now. We're going to look at that. God intended that this be the process, uh, uh, not law. I mean, every, it's amazing how we go, when we go through this and we look at, at, at all of these verses, uh, just we it's astounding just how much we're, we are being drawn our attentions being drawn away from uh, human performance so there's a process that's involved in this in this walk it is very much a work of god it's not as much a work of the believer as the believer might tend to think uh, we are changed as we behold him in this book in his word and we have we have it is should be our desire uh, to share in his sufferings we have those in common his sufferings which can't be known through human performance no matter how well performed you can't know those sufferings i want you to consider just how our lord suffered at whose hands did he suffer and of course he suffered at the hands of, primarily at the hands of his own people uh, particularly the separatists Okay, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, the 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 self-righteous Jews, uh, Judaism, Orthodox Judaism. Uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The same is true today. The wide range of 
context proves this experiential knowing, and that word is, is gnosko, it's an experiential knowledge, it's not oida, it's not an intellectual knowledge, it is an experiential knowledge, that, that this experiential knowledge is a work of God. It's not a work of our own. There's nothing here on our part in, this, in these verses here that you can read, that you could say, honestly say, that, th that this, these are things that we do, uh, quote unquote, in order to make ourselves more acceptable to God. There's nothing on our part to do here. Uh, every word, every sentence, every phrase, every paragraph, every chapter, every, every epistle expresses this point. It pushes this point. It seems almost as if the Holy Spirit went out on a limb to get the point across, the vital point across, that we are not under law, but we're under grace. And that well, what we're looking at here is something metaphysical. It's something supernatural. It's something otherworldly rather than something natural or, or earthy or carnal or fleshly. And why wouldn't we want that? Why, wouldn't, why would we not welcome that? Is, is, would be my question to most of modern Christianity today. The fellowship of his suffering speaks of our message. Uh, ministry itself. Uh, uh, suffering, knowing this is not what Christians want. That's part of that suffering. When I look around me and I see that this, Christians do not want, they don't, they're not interested in talking about the righteousness of God that's based on faith. They're not interested in talking about the exchange life, theirs for his. They're not, they're not interested in, in moving away from everything that was actually uh, uh, shown to us to be uh, the adversary of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're not interested in that. And that's part of that suffering. We suffer in the same sense that he did. At, at whose hands did he suffer? The world religious system based on human merit. The fellowship of his suffering speaks of our life, our, our ministry, our message. Being made conformable to his death, that is being made conformable, we, we don't make ourselves conformable, folks. Even the English, now it, it comes across really strong in the Greek, but even the English, you, you don't have any excuse for coming away from this saying that you make, yourselves, you make yourself conformable to his death. It says being made, that's a passive voice. God is the operator, the outside agent that does this. And it speaks of our death with him. Okay? The, why does he mention the power of his resurrection? Because we were raised with him. Paul, it is his desire that he know the power of his resurrection. Now, on the surface, you would, if, if you, all you did was limit that phrase, the power of his resurrection, to his being raised, I don't think we've done justice to the text. He wants to experience that same power of his resurrection. He wants to realize that the power of that resurrection works as in his life as well. Because we were raised with him. Our resurrection from the dead describes our walking in grace. Our walking in the work, the, the perfect finished work of Christ. It's a walk in newness of life. His life. It is not I, but Christ. For to me, to live is Christ. It's not us, folks. It's Christ. Our ministry, our message, our focus, everything should be directed toward the person, the work, the majesty, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But this, this doesn't seem to be what so many Christians want. We tend to shy away from, even Christians who understand that this, all of this, uh, the right way, they tend to shy away from that cross, from that suffering. This is a cross, folks. The cross crucifies self. So, you know, happy funeral. Being made conformable to his death, that speaks of our death with him. 
and the power of His resurrection because we were raised with Him. We have this treasure. We know we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not ourselves. We don't have any confidence in the flesh. We place no confidence in the flesh. Call, Paul considered all of that to be loss. He considered all that to be rubbish. Folks, we have no righteousness apart from him. Now, we have been made, I pointed this out, Romans chapter 5, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You didn't make yourself righteous. Positionally, you've been placed in Christ. You've been made the righteousness of Christ just in the same way that you were made a sinner in Adam. You had nothing to do with that. You had nothing to do. I, I had nothing to do. You had nothing to do with being made the righteousness of God in Christ. You stand as a believer in Christ before God as righteous as his son. Now, you may not believe that, but that's what this book says. I think Christians find that a difficult concept to grasp because they're always wrestling and they're always combating and they're always struggling against sin. We were told in Romans chapter 6 to reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive unto God in Christ. In Hebrews, I believe, chapter 12, verse 1, we're to, to lay aside that singular sin that, that, that so uh, burdens us down that we are uh, so easily besets us. What so easily besets us is our sin nature. But folks, we don't, God has nothing to do with the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. God is not looking at your flesh. He's not judging your flesh. He's not, he's not trying to, to, he's not working in your life or mine to try and improve the old man, to make something good out of something that he put to death with Christ when Christ died. And when Christ died, you died with him. When he was buried, you were buried with him. When he was raised, you were raised with him to walk in newness of life. You were not crucified with, buried with, raised with Christ when you accepted Christ. Okay? This book makes it absolutely crystal clear that Paul was, was crucified with Christ when Christ died. He was raised with Christ when Christ raised. And so were we. Every try to imagine if you can, because it is it is an absolute fact that every single Christian person who would ever become a Christian was identified according to Romans chapter six, baptized into his death. Okay? Identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's Romans chapter six. Every single one. This is how we start out. We start out with our feet on resurrection ground, even though we don't know that. You may live 40, 50 years and never, and never realize that you began your walk in Christ, your life in Christ, on the basis of a righteousness that wasn't your own. We're called saints, dearly beloved. Our resurrection from the dead describes our walking in grace, not law, and, and walking in newness of life, his life, not I, but Christ. Or as Paul says to me, to live is Christ. Uh, go over to Galatians uh, chapter 2, it's not I, but Christ. Go over to Corinthians, it's that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. We have no confidence in the flesh. We read, we read that right here in our, in, this own, in our own study. Paul makes it clear he has no confidence in the flesh. We're looking at the exchanged life, ours for his. That's what it is. It's a complete, as a whole, look, think of it as a, in sort of in the aorist tense. Uh, it, is a, it's, it, it is a, the process is in our growing and in an ever increasing experiential knowledge of what is already true of us. We're not trying to attain to anything. We're not trying to add, to, add anything to the perfect finished work of Christ, folks. 
Our lives are, for the most part, as Christians, cons it consists of an ever-increasing growing in knowledge, grace, and knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's, it's becoming more and more aware of just who we are in Christ. We are clearly shown how righteousness is achieved. Okay, it's on the basis of faith. It's the righteousness of God, okay, that comes on the basis of faith. It's not achieved on the human level. And it is the very salvation, the very deliverance that we were shown in chapter 2, verse 12. You know, work out your salvation, your deliverance from fear and trembling, for it is God at work in you both to will and do of His good pleasure. We're, we are looking at the results here in this passage. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, verse 10, 11, 12, 13. We're looking at the results. This is not a cause and effect thing. It's not. There's nothing here that says, well, if you, we do something, then we'll, we'll be this, or God will do this. If we do this, God will do this. You're not told to do anything here. You're told to realize just what is true of you. And to realize that it, in your, it was Paul's desire, and it's the Holy Spirit, his expressed desire, that we as Christians, we grow into the realization of what is true of us in Christ. So it's the very salvation, the very deliverance that we were shown in chapter 2. This is the prize, the goal. This is the goal that we strive toward. Okay, uh, the prize. What is the prize? The prize is our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is why God apprehended us. It's the whole reason why He laid hold of us was, was for what we're looking at here. Looking ahead, not behind. And I don't know how many Christians look behind. They prefer to look behind. You know, we can get so caught up in looking behind so we're looking forward that we forget about the present. <clears throat> Verse 13 refers to the believer intense, intently. The word in the Greek is strong. It is an, an intense reaching forward to experience the full realization, the full experiential knowledge of this out-resurrection from the dead. That's a very unique word. It's only used once here. Out-resurrection from the dead. The form, our former way of life, the, our not walking in the flesh, our not walking according to the flesh, our not walking in according to the old man, law. That former way of life. And so, and it was given to us when we were raised from the dead with Christ. We were made the righteousness of God in Christ. Verse 14, uh, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. This is our high calling, and few seem concerned about it. It's really clear from the text that as we get, as we see Him, as we get glimpses of Christ, we get to know Him. And in the process, we become changed. Verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect, that is mature, be thus minded. And if anything, if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. This is not something realized through human reasoning. It's not something realized through human logic or natural uh, deduction or you know it's not naturally discerned and if you want a great mirror passage to this it would be galatians chapter 2 you know, for i through the law am dead to the law that i might live unto god i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ lives in me in the life which i now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if any righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain.
I had a brother here recently. He went in an email, you know, or a text message. I believe he he was uh, concerned about whether or not he had received the grace of God in vain. Folks, the only way that we receive the grace of God in vain is to is to is and notice that we've received the grace of God. Okay. Well, first of all, we've received it. But we receive God's grace in vain when we don't we don't live, we don't walk, we our behavior, we don't conduct ourselves in the way that this book says that we should. That, that we're dead to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. Folks, if you are living according to the law, you've received the grace of God in vain. Now, that doesn't affect your, the, your, your destination. It doesn't, affect the, it doesn't change the fact that God said that, that He will never leave us nor forsake us. The, the, the work that He began in you, He will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That has nothing to do with affecting the outcome or the destiny, the, the, the destination, your ultimate destination. It doesn't affect whether you're going to heaven or not. You can receive the grace of God, live your entire lives uh, in Christ as, as saints, by the way, as those made the righteousness of God in Christ. Live your entire lives with all of these truths that because Christ died in your place, all of these truths pertain to you. They're relative to your life, and yet you live your entire life either in ignorance of those truths or even in some rare cases, even outright rebellion against those truths. But it doesn't change the fact that God loves us and that He died in our place, that He's directing our lives, that He knows the, the paths that we take. And when, he, and when He's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. You know, we know that Christ in, in uh, you know, Jesus' face was marred beyond all human likeness. I don't think Mel Gibson in the movie uh, The Passion of Christ. I don't think he did it justice. I don't think I don't think our beloved Lord was even recognizable. Now that was only part of the suffering that he endured, and a great part it was. But I, I just want to point that out, just for you to think about, because. It is we we behold as in a mirror dark it's when we behold Christ in the word we're changed into his likeness uh, this is what he did this is how he suffered on our behalf folks in order that the Lord's endure, our Lord Jesus Christ suffered and endured so much so that we would, what, no struggle and, uh, and live with struggle and doubt. Is that why? Is that why he did that? Uh, that we would live with guilt. That we would live in confusion and, and, and frustrated and, and bewildered most of the time. Uh, insecure, not knowing really for certain whether God really loves us or how much He loves us. I mean, is that why that he's, His face was marred beyond human likeness? Christians would understand these things, folks, if they were taught this from the pulpit, but that's rare today. We are living in an age in which the light, and we, are, we are light bearers, and that light is, seems to be growing dim uh, by the day. This is the normal Christian life that you're looking at here, folks. The exchanged life, ours for his. That's the normal Christian life. The abnormal Christian life is trying to make yourself, trying to present your own body a, a, a dead sacrifice. That, that is the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. So you're presenting a dead sacrifice to Christ. 
in place of, of the living sacrifice that he's made you. And this present age is so blind to these truths, it's, it's just astounding. And this resurrection life will remain what it is until the day that those in Christ are raised from the dead, or until the day that we who remain alive at his coming rise up to meet him in the air. Nothing's going to change the fact that you stand on resurrection ground today, though you may not live like it. You may not act like it. You may not talk like it. That may not be your conversation. Your conversation may be may not be uh, uh, on Christ. Your your conversation may may not be Christ. It may be sin, self, the law, the world, what you can do, how you how you can better serve God, what you need to do to become more acceptable to God. That may be your conversation, but it doesn't change the fact that God has made us, made you made us who we are it is a uh, sanctification is really progressive sanctification and some have couched, couched it in those terms I, I i tend to shy away from that expression progressive sanctification by one offering as he is sanctified forever those who are his but as we grow in grace and knowledge of him which should be our desire uh, growing away from our own self-confidence, our own confidence in ourself, and growing toward a life of rest and joy and peace in Him and in, in His perfect finished work and how He applied that work to our lives. If that is our desire, if that is truly our desire, I believe God will fulfill that desire. But if it's not, It could very well be that the Lord allows us to just go our own way. My heart goes out to everyone who's going through difficult circumstances, difficult trials. Just know that God has you there for a reason. That He's uh, He's never uh, uh, going to leave you nor forsake you. And so, until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.